welcome to Virtual Insights, Winds of Change. We're so glad you're here. Um, on behalf of the American Folk Art Museum, thank you for joining us tonight. As many of you know, our museum is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught artists across time and place, and we're thrilled to celebrate our 60th anniversary this year. Uh, as we tune in from our homes this evening, we acknowledge that our museum stands upon the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware peoples, and we honor members of this nation, past, present, and future. My name is Persephone Allen, and I'm the Curator of Programs and Engagement at the Bogart Museum. I'm a white woman with shortish brown hair, um, a lot of brown hair, in a white and purple check shirt coming to you from my living room, uh, where you can see some art beside me. And we'll be asking all of our speakers tonight to introduce themselves with visual descriptions, too. As we enjoy um, really beautiful late summer evenings, or especially, or, or afternoons or mornings, depending on your time zone, um, we're really grateful to connect online, which would not be possible without your support. Thank you for being here and for donating to sustain ongoing virtual experiences like this one and all of the incredible events we've organized this year. This evening's conversation is being recorded and will be published online in the coming weeks, so please feel free to revisit. Closed captioning in English can be activated by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. We recommend that you set your viewings tonight to presenter mode, and we invite you to share questions for our speakers throughout the program by using the chat and Q&A features at the bottom of your screens. And we will make every effort to respond to as many of these as possible during the conversation. This program is inspired by our current exhibition, American Weather Veins, The Art of the Winds, curated by Robert Shaw, coordinated by Emily Gibalt, with additional interpretation by consulting scholar Joseph Zordon. And here on our welcome slide, you can see um, a sea dragon, this really curving serpentine line for the sea dragon um, a weather vane from the show. It presents over 70 objects related to the production, collection, and interpretation of weather vanes as tools, as works of art, and objects of fantasy, status, and identity. For those interested, you can reserve free tickets online to see it, as well as order your copy of the accompanying book from our online store. As weather vanes were objects historically designed to signal shifts in the wind and weather patterns and predicting the weather has become ever more fraught with climate change, uh, we wanted to use these historic works of art as a point of departure for a broader dialogue tonight on the present implications of global environmental crises. Um, and while the subject is always relevant given the extreme weather conditions, storms, fires, and floods that have been impacting communities around the world, uh, a conversation on the intersection of art and climate change has never felt more urgent. We are thrilled and honored to be joined by artists, scholars, and policymakers creating work about this issue for this panel. Um, and everyone will be introduced this evening by our moderator, Piranha Reddy. It's my pleasure to introduce. Piranha Reddy is an independent cultural producer based in New York, working at the intersection of art, civic engagement, and social movements. She is currently a member of Creative Time's first think tank cohort, which is exploring new methodologies to dismantle exclusionary and colonialist modes of artistic creation and presentation. She was most recently director of programs at A Blade of Grass, a nonprofit that advances the field of socially engaged art. And she previously served as director of public programs and community engagement at the Queens Museum from 2005 to 2018, where she organized both exhibition related and community based programs. And we're really thrilled um, that Piranha is with us tonight. But before turning it over to Piranha, um, we'd like to go to the next slide, please. And we wanted to open briefly by taking a closer look at a work from the exhibition that inspired this program. Um, this is a weather vane. It's uh, modeled after a Hudsonian curlew, which is known for its distinctive um, long curved beak. It's a type of shorebird native to the Northeast that was popular with game bird hunters. Uh, this vein was commissioned in the 1870s by the Curlew Bay Club, a um, hunting club in Cape May, New Jersey, that it installed it upon a barn on their property, um, where it stayed for almost six decades. It's a monumental work. It's very hard to imagine that um, on this small slide, slide, but it stands nearly four feet tall and almost eight feet long. It's stunning in the graphic simplicity of its silhouette, um, and we can imagine that its gilded surface would have sparkled in the sunlight. Its surface also belies its exposure to the elements and the impact of different weather conditions over time, as we can see that the gold leaf is slightly worn and eroded, revealing sheet metal and iron straps underneath. 
Although this was made as a symbol for a club, its evocative form may remind those of us viewing it now that it's not only this physical object which has been impacted by time and by climate change, but of course, um, it's birds like the ones that this is modeled after, their habitats, the shorelines, the bodies of water that they inhabited that have changed as well. So today we're moving forward in time um, from this 19th century work to bring in contemporary concerns and artist perspectives. Um, and it's my pleasure to turn it over to Piranha. Hi, thank you so much, Persephone. Um, I'm Prerna Reddy, and I am a um, Indian woman with a medium brown complexion and red lipstick and her hair pulled back in a, uh, an attic bedroom with a framed artwork behind me. Um, I am just gonna tell you a little bit about the format of um, today's conversation. Um, and then we'll just get to it. Um, and I'll introduce the panelists along the way briefly, but um, I thought it would be fun to start first by, um, we, I asked all the panelists to share an image or a video of a project that wasn't theirs um, to start out with as a sort of icebreaker, but something they thought was really successful or effective in communicating climate urgency or helping people um, connect to climate change in, uh, in a personal or different way um, than usual. And I'm excited that we have people whose own work is so interesting regarding that and who have very different strategies and we will end with that. So I've kind of I've flipped the format. So uh, we'll hear about their own um, recent and, and current work um, at the end. And in the middle, we'll have plenty of time for a discussion. And I invite you all as audience members to um, put your questions in the Q&A section um, at any time. I'll be kind of rolling them into the conversation. We won't have like just one Q&A period at the end. So as you think of questions, please just put them in the Q&A and I'll, I'll try and um, include them uh, where they make the most sense. So with that, we're gonna start with the, the show and tell, as I call it, at the beginning. Um, and first we have Nilda Mesa, who is a visiting lecturer at the Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences Po, and also an adjunct professor at the School of International Public Affairs at Columbia University, um, and an adjunct senior research scientist at the Earth Institute. Uh, she has a forthcoming book called Collaborating for Climate Resilience that is going to be published in September by Rutledge, and she'll be telling us more about that at the end where everyone is sharing their work. Um, but with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Nilda to describe herself and share her example. Thank you, Piranha. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, I am a uh, Latina woman with um, white-ish skin and frizzy, dark, very dark hair that's past my shoulders. I'm wearing a white jacket and a blue-green scarf, and I'm sitting in the study of um, my home in the Hudson Valley, New York, with bulletin board behind me and lamps and other tchotchkes. <laughs> so, um, and, and I also, I wanna mention that in addition to academic and, you know, sort of policy work that I've done over the years, um, I also took a detour and went to art school somewhere in there. And so, and was a practicing artist for a number of years. Um, and I don't really see that much of um, a distinction, a hard bright line between the creativity that you need um, for making art and the creativity that is called for these days for um, policy making in the realm of climate. So with that, the image that I picked is one showing the flooding in Belgium this summer. Um, the, as, as everybody has no doubt heard by now, there were massive floods in Germany and Belgium and also in China. Um, this on top of fires that we all know about in California that are, you know, turning our atmosphere sort of orangey uh, during the day all the way here on the East Coast of the US. Um, and the thing about this summer and about these events, um, there are two big reasons, at least two big reasons for these extreme events this summer. One is as the planet heats up, 
um, and as the atmosphere heats up, it's able to hold more moisture and for longer periods of time. In addition, with uh, the warming of the Arctic as well as the Antarctic and the poles um, increasing their rate of warming faster than the equator, um, what that means is that that's disturbed the jet stream, which is the air that divides um, various types of weather from one part of the globe to another. And what that's done is that that has slowed down in some cases, these heavy accumulations of moisture and water in the atmosphere, which is why you see much more rain and um, much more extreme storm events that last for longer um, in places like Germany, China and um, Belgium and so forth. Um, and in addition, this disturbance in the jet stream, weakening it, slowing it down, shifting it over has also meant that hot air is on, um, it, hot air tends to sort of sit for longer. Um, and so that's where you see these heat waves. Um, so one of the things that I'm gonna be talking about later is the need for better systems. And I don't mean weather systems, I mean systems wherein people can um, collaborate more on many different levels um, and so forth, so as to uh, deal with and become resilient to um, these types of extreme weather events and then to deal with the deeper uh, reasons that are underlying the changes in our global climate. Thank you. Thank you, Nilda. Next, um, we're going to be joined by Mary Mattingly, who's an artist based in New York City, whose work explores issues of sustainability, climate change, displacement, and I think most importantly asks um, the public how we can um, reconnect or rethink our relationship to nature and natural resources. Um, and her work has been exhibited at Storm King, the International Center of Photography, um, and the Bronx Museum. She also worked with the Department of State on a smart, a smart power project in Manila. And um, I was able to collaborate with her in numerous projects that she did in Flushing Meadows Park and saw just how, um, how she could really bring curiosity of a general public to, um, to issues of climate change, to connecting people to water systems. And I think um, you'll learn a lot from more about her work later. But first, Mary, can you describe yourself and yeah. share your share your project? Yeah, thank you, Karina. So um, my name is Mary. I am a white woman with bleach brown hair and the background is the Connecticut River. Um, I wanted to share this slide. This is three examples of artwork that I think for me effectively illustrate different aspects of the climate emergency through what I'll refer to in Linda Weintraub's terms as e an eco-materialism. So that's an eco-materialism that in, in this case, I think is both, are both um, collaborative and participatory. So she writes about eco-materialism um, that sort of affirms this emergent philosophy of neo-materialism and that also attends to the, what she says, pragmatic urgency of environmentalist of environmentalism. So the top left is Gabriela Salazar, and this is an image of clay blocks that were made from used coffee grounds. So she said that the process of making coffee clay is really central to the work. It's this repetitive manual labor in the Sisyphean attempt to make a thing that you know is going to sort of fall apart. And I think in this way, the work really captures this relatable emotion vis-a-vis -vis the labor that we're involved in and also the precarity of our individual situations, which I think also speaks to the contradictory emotions that we might feel when we're contemplating climate change. So it's emotional, it's precarious, and sometimes it's out of reach and delayed from the other precarities of daily life. And meanwhile, I think this material combination inspires. So since hearing about this work, I've heard about houses that have been made from coffee husks and coffee grounds being mixed in with papercrete for more lasting structures. So I think um, in different unexpected ways that this, this project and these projects can also really contribute to work in other fields that really resonate. And on the bottom two, the bottom two images are Guy Riefler with John Sabra. So they have together collaborated on this pigment made from extracted toxic acid mine drainage from polluted streams um, from abandoned coal mines. So really together they've been able to extract large quantities of this acid mine drainage and have worked with companies like 
um, gamblin to produce paints on a larger scale. And then finally, the top right image is a biodegradable balloon that's co-designed by Jenny Kendler and folks at the NRDC. It's filled with milkweed seeds that are indigenous to the areas that she works in and really already ready to be given away so that participants can release the floating seeds, which I think calls to mind artworks like, um, you know, the power of, I'm really familiar with Baja Erlen's ice books and the, and the power that those have to engage with people around the world. So I think Kendler's project here is more directly about an interdependence between humans and monarchs and as they're essential in maintaining a balanced food web with ecosystems that are critical to in sustaining us. So what I believe is that really participatory tools or projects can become alliances. They can empower more people to ask them to be active participants in building collective demands and really exploring and expressing alternatives and working locally and sharing successes with others can often, I think, offset feelings of grief and anxiety. And those are all things that I think are really important when it comes to work about climate change. Thank you, Mary. Um, next, I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing Yuna Chowdhury, who is a, a professor of English drama and, and environmental studies at NYU and the director of XE Experimental Humanities and Social en Engagement. She's a pioneer in the fields of eco theater and animal studies and uh, it participates in collaborative creative projects, including um, a multi-platform intervention entitled Dear Climate that you'll hear about later. Um, but first, Yuna, um, can you describe yourself and share the project sure. from your show and tell? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Prerna, and thank you, uh, Persephone, uh, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, I'll start with a visual description of myself. Um, I'm a woman with light brown skin and white hair. I'm wearing a green shirt and there's a wall behind me with artwork. Uh, turning to the work I've chosen to discuss, um, I'll describe it as uh, we go through the slides. I have quite a lot of slides. Uh, it's called 36.5, a durational performance with the sea by Sarah Cameron Sunder. Um, so a woman stands on a seashore at low tide um, the water lapping her feet. She remains standing as the tide comes in and the water rises. Uh, it rises to the knees, uh, to her hips, and at the highest tide to her neck. Um, um, she remains standing as the tide begins to go out um, and the water begins to recede slowly, again, down to her chest, her waist, her knees, her ankles, until uh, about 13 hours after she began uh, her silent, immersive vigil, the water is no longer touching her and the performance is over. There's no dialogue, no movement, no action, just 13 hours of being with the tide coming in and out. Onlookers and friends do whatever they want to. They sit and watch, um, they play music or dance. Some of them join her in the water for a period of time. Um, the work's been performed in many different seas off the shores of the Netherlands, Mexico, uh, the US, Bangladesh, Brazil, and Kenya. Uh, and was be performed twice more off the coast of New Zealand and finally in the artist's home sea, the Atlantic Ocean, here on the shores uh, of New York City in 1920. Uh, sorry, 2020. The last two performances were interrupted by COVID and are now scheduled for next year. So um, I chose this work. Um, uh, I love it for many reasons. One is the, uh, that it addresses a major issue of climate art in a very powerful and effective way. And that's a problem of scale, the difficulty that we humans have in relating our own individual lives and experiences to the vast arena where climate change is playing out. So in this work, the artist connects an individual human being to a planetary phenomenon, the ocean's tides, in a very direct, physical, tactile, intimate way. And so she creates a kind of embodied felt 
image of sea level rise. Uh, while also through the durational structure, so the fact that it's 13 hours, she also is projecting ideas of endurance, resilience, courage, uh, and even hope. Uh, just very quickly, the second, another thing I love is it's called a durational performance with the, with the sea. Um, and so this is about its partnership with the more than human world, instead of more common stances like inquiry or translation or you know even domination through ant anthropocentrism uh, this approach partnering with the more than human world um, requires and models um, this anthropocentrism uh, humility openness uh, willingness to learn i'll stop there thank you yuna uh, and lastly we have becca akinopoulos the director of the Natural History Museum, an ongoing art intervention that leverages the power of history, monuments, museums, and movements uh, to support environmental and climate justice. And the museum is a project of Not an Alternative, a collective uh, that works at the intersection of art, activism, and critical theory. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Becca to share her project. Thanks, Piranha. Hi, everybody. I'm Becca Konimopoulos, a um, white Greek American uh, woman with uh, chest length dark hair sitting in my 92 year old father's study that has wood paneling and um, framed things and has looked the same for the last 50 years. Um, I'm happy to be joining you and uh, the picture um, that I have here is of uh, indigenous organizers from various communities around the world at the Paris Climate Summit in 2015, holding a red line, a banner that is simply a cloth fabric, and it went on for blocks and blocks and really miles. Um, and this was a powerful demonstration that uh, we were very inspired by um, as artists and activists who um, took part in various projects at the Climate, climate Summit. Um, but uh, to, to hold the red line as this visual signifier that indicated both uh, we are Mother Earth's red line, where indigenous communities are really the front lines, the first to feel the impacts of climate change um, and to feel them the worst. Um, but also with uh, less than 4% of the world's population, indigenous peoples steward more than 85% of the world's biodiversity and are really ground zero for fossil fuel expansion and other extractive projects that threaten our collective future. Um, and so uh, indigenous communities and tribal nations are also leading environmental and climate justice movements um, across the world. So this was incredibly inspiring. And I'll go to the next photo here at the Paris Climate Summit. One of the projects we were involved with uh, as the Natural History Museum in our incarnation, we um, uh, sought to uh, get fossil fuel sponsors and funders of climate denial kicked out of museums, uh, off their boards, and so on. Um, and we teamed up with many collectives, uh, artist-led collectives around the world at the Paris Climate Summit to join efforts where they were doing similar work in their respective uh, countries um, to come together and really signal uh, the presence of this a uh, rapidly growing nascent global fossil free culture movement. So that's what this image is. It's uh, in front of the Louvre in Paris, uh, which is sponsored by ENI and Total, two state owned uh, oil companies. And um, people deployed black umbrellas that when held together spelled out fossil free culture. And, um, and you see that in the image and you also see at the very front of the image, the red line banner um, that indigenous environmental network and um, their uh, comrades laid out uh, in front of the umbrellas. And that was a very last minute um, gesture that they offered um, at this direct action. It was an intervention that was not announced in advance. Um, and it, it really got us to thinking and shifting our practice from the black line, which represents the death 
right? And, and with our project uh, focused on um, museums and fossil fuel sponsors and so on, turning to indigenous communities and other frontline communities um, who represent the alternative, the path forward um, and, and the power, the life that cannot be captured. Um, so I'll talk more about that later. Great. Thanks, Becca. And I um, saw in the Q&A that folks were really interested in um, getting the names of the artists or, or the projects um, the, or the folks who made those projects happen. So maybe um, between, if, if you have it, uh, if any of the panelists have that, you know, at your fingertips, please share it in the chat. Otherwise, um, we can collect those and make those available along with the recording to all the registrants um, in a week or two. So. Um, Thank you for that. I guess one of the things that um, you know I was hoping for is for each of you to engage each other's show and tell um, projects a little bit to um, to see kind of what what were the commonalities in terms of what successful strategies um, might be, or what you know were there certain things that across these projects that you felt um, you know need to be pulled out as a common theme. And I guess one of them to me is is you know, I think Yuna captured this so well in the sense of like, what are the ways in which people can feel it in an embodied way, um, you know, can, can engage with climate, you know, not just as facts or not just as, you know, here's the enemy, you know, or here's the bad policy, but like, how do we engage when, with, you know, all of our senses and our emotions, the scale, et, et cetera. So that's one thing that I think, um, you know, is perhaps missing, you know, from some, some actions that I think that artists definitely have um, been, been at the forefront of trying to change, right, in that sense, uh, or can be a useful role for artists and performance in particular to, to add to the, to the kind of arsenal of tools that we have to communicate. Does anyone else want to, from our, our panelists, want to comment on other people's projects? You know, are you um, lifting a finger? I am lifting a finger. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I um, was kind of following up on what you just said, Brenna. I thought that uh, um, something Mary referred to, that is the neo-materialism, eco-materialism, this emergent attitude philosophy that uh, um, is, is connected to this idea of uh, personalizing, literalizing, uh, embodying, making it uh, present um, because it's a way of pushing back against a long tradition in uh, Western art and literature in which nature was always a metaphor, a metaphor for the human. Uh, it was always displaced, you know, it was all standing and whether it was animals or um, landscapes, plants, they were often, uh, you know, um, stand-ins for our hopes and dreams. And uh, one of the things that neo-materialism uh, asks us to do is be literal, really focus on the felt um, and experience phenomenological details of um, the more than human world around us uh, and, not, and don't always flee to our philosophical symbolic registers. Nilda? Uh, one of the things that struck me as I was looking at all of the images and you know yours in particular was that, you know, this notion you can't really separate the human from the effects, you know, so the image that I showed was the folks in the boat trying to escape you know, this disastrous flooding and you know you showed this individual who is standing in water, you know, voluntarily all that time and experiencing it fully. Um, and the, the people who were in the boat in Liège in Belgium certainly were not, you know, separating that. And I think that there is, you know, there is, um, I guess, you know, over a century, something that's developed where people really see in some ways or have seen nature as an enemy, as something to be controlled, as something to be um, you know, excluded and made safe. You see this very much in places like New York City, where everything is sort of, you know, horizontal, rectangular. Even when you're outside, it's very much controlled. Maybe you'll see these little weeds, 
but the little weeds will, will pop up regardless. So no matter how much it is that humans try to control or believe that they have the power to do that, they can't, <laughs> you know, and, and there are these greater forces that are actually part of us as well. And I think that, you know, the other panelists here have, have shown that very starkly, very dramatically. Yeah, I was also thinking about, um, you know, what you were saying about the power of scale and duration and endurance. And I think um, it's, it's really fascinating to look at these effective projects, like the ones that you all showed and, and Becca, uh, thinking about the large scale collectivity that um, is made up of small, intimate, um, intimate size scale. And then yet it's broadcast in this big way that brings so many people in. And, um, and then going back and forth, I think between those scales in order to, to make work accessible or make ideas accessible or what you're saying, you know, about abstraction, making um, art less abstract in a sense um, by, by starting from the materials. Um, so th those are the things that struck me. So. I'll add one thought that um, one of the things that Indigenous Environmental Network said around the Paris Climate Statement and many in the climate movement have said subsequently is we need system change, not climate change, right? And, um, and then there was a big action on Wall Street around climate change uh, in that uh, wake of um, Hurricane Sandy. Um, in which I think the, it, you know, and Rising Tides is an activist climate organization. The uh, Wall Street action, I think, was um, Flood Wall Street, right? Um, so I'm thinking about this um, notion of, you know, we, we, we are one with nature, yet at the same time, we act upon it and it, it uh, impacts us. And so there is a division there. Um, so just imagining um, the world is uh, one harmonious place um, negates and obfuscates political division. Um, yet uh, what I think the, where, where I see a lot of promise and potential in many of these practices you just showed is um, Sarah uh, Cindy, Cameron Cindy, right, is um, like the the waves and the tide, you know, in um, it, it, in much of the sort of transcendental art, like that that is the that is the threat. Nature is the threat, and yet she sort of embraces that, right, and makes peace with it. And that is the same thing that you can see in the flood Wall Street actions. Is like to to embrace the storm. We are the storm we've been waiting for. Um, and when you transpose that into a practice that elevates a collectivity, then you start to see the political potential of art and the signifiers we choose and the practices and performances we elevate um, to advance that system change framework that is so needed. Um, Karina, may I jump in? Uh, yep. Yeah, I wanted to take that further what Becca just said um, about the, the political and ethical dimension of this, uh, of our um, affiliation with the more than human world. Um, and uh, I think, I mean, one aspect of uh, uh, Sarah's piece that I wasn't able to talk about was the fact that it's also a community engagement project and that wherever she goes to create the image of herself, uh, it takes an enormous effort on her part, but also that of the, the willing partners in the community to make that happen in a, in a way that is not um, uh, disrespectful or um, you know, frivolous or uh, meaningless. Um, and that sort of genuinely contributes to um, the understanding and discourse around uh, climate and sea level rise. So uh, to me, that's a, um, to me, that's actually one of these things that you were asking about for another, the um, uh, defining characteristics of climate art or some of one of them. Um, and I think in fact, our, our panel and what you invited us to do in a way models one of those, which is that I think this work is intensely collaborative um, 
it's also, um, so it's collaborative, uh, you know, not just in the making of the thing, but also in really attending to each other's work and lifting up each other's work um, and being in conversation with it. Um, and I think the other thing that also came through in much of what we said is that this work is intensely interdisciplinary. So there is definitely, you know, a huge um, uh, component um, of, of science and of a need for artists to be, you know, to put in the time to be serious about that. And that came across in what Nelda, Nelda was saying. Um, but then also the amount of work you have to do to inform yourself about the, the politics of a community, of a nation, uh, the history, all these things would require us to turn to many different disciplines. Nelda, go ahead. Yeah, so one of the things that I um, wind up teaching about a lot in my classes, and my classes um, are you know, focused on energy climate policy in urban areas or planning for sustainability in urban areas, that kind of thing. So one of the things that I, that I try to get my students to understand is how very local these issues are and how you really have to drill down. The inclination of so many of the students who come in think, you know, oh, you know, from the national level, we can wave a magic wand, we can pass a law, we can do something that will fix everything. And it just doesn't work that way. So it's, it's so important, I think, to get people to understand that. And there are real geographic, atmospheric, whatever it is, differences, you know, when you go from city to city, place to place, whatever it is, and you have to take those into account. You know, that's just putting, a, putting aside whatever cultural differences, the economy, and so forth. So it becomes a very complex um, set of issues to solve. And it's not one size fits all. And the only way you can really get there is through having folks collaborate really with each other and understand what's going on with each other. Thanks for that reminder. I see a couple of raised hands, but if you could instead put your questions in or comments in the Q&A instead of raising hands, because we're, um, that's how I'm going to keep track of, of everyone else and how they want to jump into the conversation. And I guess the other thing about science, and maybe I'll ask Becca and Mary to weigh in on this, because I know that one of Natural History Museum's core pieces of work, especially at the beginning, um, was definitely around how do we um, retake the conversation of science? How do we engage the public in science? How do we stop non-science, you know, non-scientific ways of thinking, you know, or anti-science um, sentiments, you know, that that have proliferated. And so, um, you know, even just not it's not just about not understanding the science or the science being thought to be too complex, but it's actually our relationship to scientists and to scientific information and the institutions that filter that research to the public. Yeah, well, um, this is going to sound uh, really harsh or bombastic, but science has failed to forestall the extinction crisis. Um, and it, that is a failure of science communication over the course of many, many decades. And um, you know, where exactly this came from, the myth of neutrality within institutions that communicate science to the public and within science itself as an enterprise um, has been um, really unfortunate because one of the uh, results of that uh, adherence to some notion of um, pure objectivity or neutrality has been a reticence to speak um, publicly. And so it's pretty hard to build a movement around science and scientists when you say, yeah, no, 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 we're neutral. We're not doing this because we care. <laughs> um, and, and I think that, that that was one of the things that we really worked on um, as the Natural History Museum and organizing scientists, particularly around the March for Science, um, which took place on, on six continents and um, sought to really steer that messaging away from yay curiosity, facts and evidence to um, there are particular kinds of science that are on the chopping block. 
you know, they're the science that protect the people and places that we love. And the science that potentially stands in the way of profit, right? Um, and so, so there, there is a war on science, um, but it's up to scientists and scientific institutions to stand shoulder to shoulder with communities who are most impacted by the war on science and um, impacted by, uh, by climate change. Um, so it goes back to that question of how do we break out of our silos, as you said, working in an interdisciplinary way, but, you know, to build shared vocabularies um, that our project as artists is always thinking about um, how we can signal or build the presence of a counterpower, something that can be viewed as an alternative. Um, and that has to be interdisciplinary and it has to include those institutions and people who have historically sat on the sidelines. Um, sorry, Mary, did, did you wanna jump in quickly and then, you know? Um, I was, I was, yeah, I, I'm in agreement. I mean, I think that science has had to be, it's been forced to be so abstract and, um, and there's another question I think about scale here too. I think there's also the issue that climate change and the effects are emotional and um, it's been impossible to talk about that um, publicly for a long time. And I think, and that's been, um, that's been a big problem for a climate movement. Um, I, think, I think the scale of, um, of a white paper is so minuscule, it has to get passed through all these channels. It's, um, yeah, I, I, I guess just, just to say, I think groups that are doing really important work are, are working on a, on a grassroots level or they're connecting grassroots um, groups together. So I, I keep talking about Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. I think that their work is so phenomenal because they're centering leadership and power of urban and rural communities that are on the front lines. And they're just, they're just really elevating those fights and stories. And I think um, that's, yeah, I, I think that that's, that's where um, people are getting engaged. If I could just throw one, one thing in there, I see Patricia Watts in the chat mentioned indigenous science and thank you for doing that. You know, that was one of the things around March for Science we, um, uh, worked with Robin Kimmerer and Kyle White and um, others to release in uh, Indigenous Science Mar March for Science letter, um, and I and I, I think this is there's something really important there where when science reduces um, the things in the world um, to their material characteristics and extracts them from context, right, and encloses them and describes them as a system that can be object, you know, studied, classified, categorized, et cetera. Um, what it loses then is, I mean, one to speak economically, all kinds of omitted variables, right? Um, and externalities aren't factored in, but two, it's like those externalities include um, shared public meanings, historical and cultural context. And that is as much what defines an object or a thing in the world as its elements and material characteristics. I, I didn't want to lose Yuna's thought because I know that she wanted to, to jump in and then I know Nilda has a comment as well. Uh, thanks, Brenna. Um, so uh, just following on on the topic of science, I agree very much with uh, Becca that uh, you know we need the critique of science and of scientific method that of, us, of the um, fa uh, fantasy of objectivity, um, you know the, the reduction of the world, uh, the you know uh, the incredibly complex world into um, dead matter, fragments of dead matter. Also, all that's very important. But I also think that. Uh, we have to, we as, as artists or culture makers, um, also really need to pay attention to the question of what our role is uh, and what, uh, what are we bringing to this conversation uh, beyond critique, beyond the you know, political support and policy. Um, I mean, one of the things I think is important to push back against um, is a kind of, um, 
uh, invitation to collaborate we sometimes get from scientists that's in fact uh, very problematic. And that's when scientists ask artists to be kind of, uh, you know, message, message uh, givers, or, you know, sort of translate uh, the uh, scientific uh, discoveries and information into more, uh, you know, accessible stories. Uh, you often hear that. And I'm afraid I've often seen artists falling prey to that. And, you know, I think it's an extraordinarily abjecting position to be put into to, uh, you know, just be the messenger. Um, and it, it, um, uh, it's, it, it's, it suggests that there is no um, distinctive and specific thing that art as a practice uh, contributes. And I think we need to, I feel we need to spend a lot more time uh, articulating that uh, and really saying what what is it that art does that's different from what activism does what what uh, you know going to school does what going to church does what you know uh, doing scientific research how is uh, is it different from all those things Nilda so I want to come to the defense of scientists. <laughs> so, having worked with many of them over the years, um, it's part of the issue that I have observed, and I'm not a scientist, I'm a recovering lawyer. So I, you know, can feel sometimes like I can talk about lots of things that I may not necessarily know about. But in this case, <laughs> um, one of the things that I've observed with scientists and particularly those in academia as opposed to those who are working for consulting firms or you know so forth is that you know the way they are rewarded the incentives that are set up for them are for them to be publishing 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 on fairly narrow topics and you know you know performing their research or whatever the re first off they're they tend to be woefully underfunded for what it is that they're trying to do. Um, it's, a, it's a terribly competitive field that you know, we have within you know, climate, environment, and so forth. Um, and I think oftentimes what happens is that they can get, they're incentivized to do narrower and narrower pieces of research. That's what they get published. That's what they get tenure for. Um, and that's how they advance. They're not necessarily good at communicating. And I think part of the reason they reach out to artists and to who anybody who they can is because they know <laughs> that they're not so good at communicating and they would like to. You know, uh, the scientists that I have worked with are very passionate about trying to get the word out, about trying to have things translated. And sometimes they're just constrained and they also get very frustrated in not being able to do that. So I think it's a failure of kind of the incentive structures and the systems that are in place more so than, you know, particular scientists and so forth. And that's not to say that, you know, this, this um, tradition, very traditional view of objectivity and so forth um, has not, you know, has, hasn't failed us to um, degrees here and there, but to some degree, that's also how policy is made, you know? So if you're a policymaker, you really rely on the data, theoretically, the data that you're, you know, that, you've, that you're presented with from scientists in this particular field. So I feel like, you know, we kind of need everybody and it's not clear who, you know, like what everyone's skills necessarily are, but we can't afford to just sort of, you know, dismiss folks. I just what, would love to say, I don't, I don't think it's a dismissal and I think you're completely correct. I think that it is systemic, like uh, we were talking about earlier. Um, and yeah, those, those systems have um, punishments and rewards that um, you're, to you're talking about, I think, Yuna, also to just talk about the space that art has. I think art um, is purposefully difficult to define and can play between these spaces. But maybe unlike science, you know, art, well, science questions for the hypothesis and searches for the answer. And I think art continues to search for the questions, the question upon the question. And maybe that's 
you know, where are relevant spaces still? Um, just wanted to add that. Hey. And Mary, oh, go ahead, Becca. Sorry, just, yeah, I, I mean, I think that really resonates with me. I mean, what you both said, yes, no, we don't throw science under the bus. We need it, right? <laughs> we need scientists. Um, but I, I see a relationship between art and science. The question is how we understand science. What understanding of science do we champion? And I think that, um, that we could see art and science both as being oriented around gaps or exclusions, right? So it's, scientists are not about the popularization of knowledge as facts, right? What they're trying to do is challenge existing knowledge. They're constantly trying to disprove each other in order to uncover what lies beyond the limits of the known. And I think artists um, very often are doing that as well. Just very quickly, I just want to point out that um, uh, being uh, engaged in a, in a critique of some aspects of science, such as scientific method, etc., is not by any means to be throwing it under the bus, not at all, or to be saying that there shouldn't be collaboration. Um, I think my point was much more to let's talk about ourselves and really look at what we do that's special and that we want to do, not about scientists. So, so if if I may, you know, one factor that is also very important is this: are the values that people have. So, if, for example, you're a scientist and you know you think, or you're a policymaker, whoever you are, and you think, well, these are the populations that we're going to value. That's what your work is going to wind up being. If that's what all the systems are going towards is valuing these particular populations or these particular economic outcomes, that's what that's what it's going to go towards. And so, you know, to I think the the recognition of um, the issues around environmental justice, the growing recognition of those issues and their importance to um, you know the world that we live in and to equity and justice and and so forth um, has been an example of that because like when I first started this work a number of decades ago, that was hardly ever talked about. People did not understand the connections between say air pollution and respiratory disease in the and you know, economic systems and you know, um, healthcare bills and access to education and so forth in ways that they may better understand now. And I think a lot of that just had to do with, um, you know, the values that people had. And, you know, so one of the things that I see is that these values are evolving over time and there's much more of a discussion now, a much healthier discussion, I think, along those lines. Um, so, and, you know, whether it's science, art, business, whatever, things tend to be going, you know, in that particular direction. Well, I think about, you know, the question of values is this place of contest, right? And it is this place where artists can put those questions around why society values or any particular, you know, science values something or economists value something or, you know, particular communities value something and, and how, do, how do those different ideas about value, you know, get uplifted, you know, have a space in which to contend publicly as opposed to privately or in the, you know, who has the biggest lawyers to make their case, et cetera. And to actually have that be a public discussion is, you know, a place that I see that artists and, you know, educational institutions, cultural institutions can bring those things to the surface in a really, uh, in a way that often, you know, those things, aren't actually on the same stage at the same time in a way. And in a way that's much more effective often than other folks can do. So I'm gonna give everyone one last chance to comment on this and then we're gonna to turn to, uh, and, and I actually feel really great that there is so much cross talk and dialogue and contestation. I think Zoom sometimes makes it hard to feel like you can jump in and actually have a conversation. And so my hope was by like not getting in the mode of talking about our own work, we could get into the kind of, you know, um, more like, how are we thinking about our work? 
Um, and I think that did happen. So I'll give everyone one last chance to maybe comment on this and then we'll go to, to the more kind of uh, presentation of your own work. Does anyone wanna say anything? Yeah. Mary? And sure. Uh, yeah, I just I just wanted to follow up with what you were saying. I think um, someone who's been really transformative for me to look at has been system scientist or social scientist Donella Meadows, who does talk about the the medium of communication as being so important when it comes to the changing of a purpose of a system, which is the most important step and thing, and that it really takes all of those elements, the events, the changing out of the one of the elements of the system, the, the president of a company, the communication second to most of all to change the purpose of the system. So I think that that's, that's really right on. And I think what we're doing, we have such an important role in, in this dialogue and conversation about climate change and changing the way it's going. Nilda? Um, so one of the thing, and I adore Danilo Meadows' work. I'm so glad that you uh, mentioned her. But um, one of the things that struck me just at the beginning of this program was um, when Persephone was introducing the program and said that the American Folk Art Museum focuses on the work of self-taught artists. And it strikes me that in this area, at best, we should all be self-taught artists, you know, we should all be creative. It's a developing area. It's one where nobody has all of the answers, but it's something where we can use artistic methods and, you know, sketch things out like however many times and try them over and over and over again. Look at the whole canvas, not just, you know, the eyes for the portrait and, you know, sort of use those kinds of techniques in order to really create um, a world that is just and fair for future generations. Great. So with that, um, I'm gonna ask Nilda to, we're gonna do the same order of show and tell with, with you know, presentations. And so Nilda, this is a chance to also show your actual artistic side and artistic practice, as well as your research work and your policy work. So um, I look forward to seeing how those things are connected for you. Okay, so thank you. Um, so um, back in the late, 1990s, early 2000s, um, I was a downtown artist studio in Tribeca and then comes 9-11. Um, myself, along with many other artists who were in that area in particular, were like, what the heck do we do now? This, what does it mean even to put, you know, that stroke of paint on a canvas in the face of so much, you know, tragedy and destruction and uncertainty coming ahead? So um, what I did was I put out this sort of call for a collective artist response to 9-11, um, which went as viral as it could have given, <laughs> given you know, the platforms of the day. <laughs> and uh, we received something like, uh, I think it was, you know, right around 300 pieces. The only requirement was that they be on um, squares of canvas, 12 inches square, that's it. Um, so things were multimedia. We received pieces from um, artists who were downtown artists. Mostly it was New York metro area artists, but we received pieces from as far away as Malaysia, from Italy, from you know all over the world and from all over the United States. Um, and some of the pieces showed images of the Twin Towers. Some of them were images, as you can see here, of, you know, firefighter, you know, images of hope um, and so forth. But it was um, a collaborative, collective, you know, response. It wound up having its first showing on the one year anniversary of 9-11 at the Williamsburg Art and Historical Center. And it's now part of the permanent collection at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. They don't show every piece all at once because it's really big, <laughs> but they have um, rotating sets of pieces. Okay, next. Um, so this is one piece I wanted to bring out, which is by the artist um, Patricia Dahlman, who's based in New Jersey. And this is a textile piece. So one of the things that, you know, she's that what she embroidered onto her piece of canvas was, you know, to the victims, my heart cries out for you. And it's the image of the twin towers with a heart breaking and drops of blood coming from that heart. Uh, and so that this is the type of anguish that, you know, you might see. Okay, next slide, please. 
Um, and then you also would see images like this of, of the globe with the number one in it showing the big blue marble and this notion that we are really all together on this one planet. Um, this is by the artist uh, Stephen Benedict. Okay, next slide. And so what it, this has, um, you know, what, I, what I've done over the years, I sort of go like, you know, people go like, wait, you were an artist, wait, you're, you know, policy like, how does this all go together on environment? And I guess the common theme for me has been about collaboration and also about these um, sort of individual gestures, individual efforts that join with other ones to create a much larger um, thing at the end of the day that actually has some impact that has some kind of effect on um, what goes forward. So this is a book that um, I've uh, co-edited with Ann Goodman, who's been at CUNY, and we have case studies in here of examples in the United States at the very local level from Detroit to West Point to um, IBM and sort of like across different sectors and across different places. New York City is in there as well, um, showing how it is that people actually came together from community level to government to academia, the military, you know, private sector, whoever, to come up with real ways to address um, climate resilience. Um, and, you know, we hope that this will provide some example, some inspiration to people. And, and communication is one of the things that, you know, was um, a common thread throughout this, um, throughout the case studies and the um, importance of um, communication amongst um, all of the parties. So, thank you. Great. Thanks. And, and maybe, you know, if we have time at the end, you could share a little bit of an anecdote about a surprising collaboration. Um, next, we have Mary. Thanks. Yeah, so I co-build ecosystems and really rely upon durational sculpture that focuses on food, water, and shelter to question relationships between, I think, people, between water and land. Um, so Swale is pictured here. It's a floating food forest that was in New York City, a city where growing or picking food on public land has been illegal for almost a century for fear that a glut of foragers would destroy an ecosystem. So it's a city where right now one in three people lives in what's considered a food desert. Um, and it relies upon common laws of the water to function as a loophole to do what was illegal on public land. Um, really because while well, some residents do have access to this 100 acres of community garden space in New York City, the city actually parks department manages 30,000 acres of public park land. So it was an intentional provocative public platform where anyone could pick foods for free um, adjacent to public parks, but where the rules were different. So uh, at any one point in time, it could have 10 to 30 collaborators or people who worked with the project in different capacities. It follows traditional ecological knowledge and the insights of people like Eleanor Ostrom, who focused on commons and claimed that really in a vibrant commons, people had this vital role to play, not only as beneficiaries, but also as co-creators and protectors and decision makers, which is what we were kind of inspired by or hoped for a public park to contain. So as a direct result of Swale and the support of community groups, including Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice and Bronx River Alliance, in 2017, the New York City Parks Department opened their first public pilot, a land-based foodway at Concrete Plant Park in the Bronx. Um, you can go to the next slide. And I think that, can, that kind of thing can continue to change maybe per perceptions and perspectives. Um, this is using climate change modeling predictions. I can look towards what would survive and perhaps thrive in the future of a place. So this is called Along the Lines of Displacement. And it was an artwork in Storm King um, that utilized palm trees that typically thrive and grow in agricultural zones nine and 10 in Florida areas and brought them early to zones six and seven to act as a folly and to address assisted plant migration as something that right now the National Forest Service is studying with ginkgos and metasequoias and prairie grasses. But how if that's pushed further, you really um, viscerally comprehend the, the potential changes to a place. I can go to the last slide. And this is a project I'm currently working on called Public Water. And what drives me to focus heavily on water and so much of the work that I do and to 
follow the business of water privatization was when around the year 2000, Bechtel and the World Bank had privatized uh, water in Bolivia, and uh, which made it unaffordable for many people in Bolivia's third largest city in Cochabamba to afford and tens of thousands of people protested uh, until the unrest led to the government revoking the water contracts. I think since then, water privatization has been something that I've followed closely, especially um, while a growing number of what are considered rural areas in the United States struggle with affording privatization costs. So this project really looked at New York City's water, water system and um, the access that we have to public water. So that's this project that I've been doing for two years now with more art, um, where I think we at one point realized how dependent we were on New Yorkers who live within and protect the drinking watershed in the city. So they live in upstate New York in the Catskills or the Delaware um, watershed. And we wanted to explore those relationships as really life partnerships that needed to be more equitable. So, so we did that through this um, through modeling this website and sharing these histories, um, some that are tragic and some that uh, we're still working with today. And then also making this sculptural element that um, illustrates the way that groundwater is cleaned. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Yuna's project. Thank you. Oh, Mary, I loved, loved hearing about your projects. Um, I'd like to talk about a collaborative project I've been doing for the last seven years uh, with um, the artist Marina Zerko. Uh, we call it Dear Climate. Um, and um, a, the title I've given here is Taking the Climate Personally. But somebody said earlier that we should, instead of talking about climate change, we need to be talking about system change. And I think we also need to be talking about imagination change and value change. And our project is about, uh, has been about trying to expand the imagination, the cultural imagination of climate change. Um, and next. Um, and also to see if we can bring uh, other kinds of um, emotional resources to bear on the subject of, other than fear and guilt which have been the pr predominant emotions that have been uh, invoked. And uh, the one we've been most committed to is the idea of friendship um, and of, of finding ways to befriend the more than human world, meet, befriend, and become next. Um, and so the idea is that, in, uh, and of course, this is all uh, very um, you know, playful and uh, we're also looking for uh, other stylistic registers um, beyond the very serious or the very didactic. So it's like, instead of cowering before these uh, scary things, you know, why don't we salute the superstorms? Next, uh, say hello to the hurricanes. Next, uh, play play knock-knock jokes with the climate. So it's about expanding next, um, our circle of sociality and just attributing a kind of playfulness and agency um, to the more than human world, um, you know, as an experiment in um, uh, expanding our relationship. So watch the pigeon, pigeon pantomime, uh, which is actually a very good thing to do all the squirrel soap opera. I'm sure some of you who live in the country uh, do watch a squirrel soap opera. Next. Um, we also wanted to, you know, go beyond and like get into things that are, uh, you know, human preoccupations that are generally not associated with, um, with the more than human world. And so we're thinking about, you know, sexuality, next romance, ne romance and flirting, um, uh, narcissism. Um, and the, uh, so we, the one modality are these posters, they use a kind of um, uh, 1980s punk rock, black and white aesthetic um, crossed with um, what you know seem to be instructional or um, educational uh, information posters, but of course the messages are are pretty enigmatic and and strange. Um, and these are all, of course, open source, available to anyone to download from our website. Um, and, and you can print them out at any scale and put them up in your in your dorm room or your um, you know local um, um, food store or where, wherever you like. 
We also have a series of uh, next um, sound pieces, which are um, climate meditations. Next, these are all on the website for those who are interested. And then we, uh, what we've been doing is, is um, developing this project uh, in partnership with uh, various um, galleries and exhibitions and partners. This was in, um, in uh, uh, the Netherlands where we really try to leverage the idea of friendship here uh, by having people write letters to the, to the climate, dear climate. Uh, next, um, this was a big project. We got a commission in uh, um, Rice University to do, a kind, this was a kind of full FEMA help station um, about getting help for, for your inner climate. And again, it's all very, very tongue in cheek. And the idea is to sort of disrupt our assumptions, our, our um, um, habits of mind uh, with which we have, um, which we've taken for granted vis-a-vis uh, -vis the more than human world. Next, uh, we'll just go quickly through the next ones. This is inside the help station. Um, there were various things, there were brochures you could get, there was a, uh, forms you could fill out. Um, and it, it was the, you know, the idea of confronting uh, just the, the extraordinary challenges to our imagination of what is coming towards us. Next, this is um, uh, this was at Storm King in the same show that uh, Mary was in. Uh, it's called General Assembly. We modeled it on the flags of the United Nations. And instead of that, uh, one seat for every nation, we had one seat for every species. Next. Um, and, uh, uh, again, we just we scaled up our, our um, uh, posters and also added a whole lot more. And, you know, over time, it's become less playful and more political because that work of just expanding the affective register, I think, has now begun to be um, engaged by many people. Uh, you know, there are, there are, there's a climate stand-up comedy, there's all kinds of things. So. Um, now there's uh, opportunities to really use the, our, um, our uh, aesthetic, our um, format to ask new sets of questions. Next. Uh, so uh, this is in the next few slides, we can go fairly soon or uh, very quickly, uh, was a um, campus-wide installation. We were invited to uh, install in um, uh, Appalachian State University. And um, it, it just puts up these signs all around campus, which look like wayfinding signs and the kinds of things the students would be, would come across as they were looking for various buildings or the direction to say the science building. Next, but instead of that, there are these um, um, uh, sort of three part little koans or puzzles and uh, uh, hidden within them is a whole climate change curriculum, a whole set of texts, which are the texts that we are all inspired by, things like Donna Haraway's um, st um, uh, Staying with the Trouble, the Great uh, um, uh, Ghosh's The Great Derangement, works like that. And so our idea was that, you know, as you move through this, you begin to encounter new ways of um, uh, uh, of inhabiting the landscape with new questions and you're going to be armed with new ideas and theories. And this was a piece we did for uh, the New York Times. And I think this uh, is one of my favorites. I think it very much uh, sums up the spirit of Dear Climate, which is to invite us to try to be as porous as we can uh, to the more than human world. Thanks. Thank you, Nafi. Nafi, we have um, Becca's project, and, and um, I believe she's going to set it up, but I, I just wanted to say that I think that there's a link, uh, Red Road to DC. So Becca's just finished a nationwide tour, and so we're really excited and thankful that uh, in the midst of recovery from, from this very large project that she's joined us here and can share some um, firsthand accounts of how this project is was received along the way and kind of what what the future might be. So, thank you, Becca.
Great, thanks, Prana. Um, so I'm going to set up a video. I'll start by telling you briefly, the Natural History Museum is a project of our art collective, uh, not an alternative. And it's a traveling pop-up museum that highlights the socio-political forces that shape nature. Um, but it's also a Trojan horse strategy um, where we uh, registered a new museum and joined professional associations and uh, museum conventions and panels and so on. Um, with an interest in uh, transforming the sector from within or helping to choreograph an interplay of inside and outside strategies um, and broadening in scope from just museums or natural history museums to really natural history disciplines more broadly. So those, uh, those disciplines and institutions that deal with the ever-changing history of the natural world. Um, and uh, I found this on the web. This, uh, this, um, uh, the photo that I showed earlier of IEN, the Indigenous Environmental Network, laying down at the Paris Climate Summit, that red line, and doing it in front of our intervention, where for the first several years of the Natural History Museum's life, we were focused on the critique. You know, what are the barriers to museums engaging climate and environmental justice topics and movements and communities and so on? And um, and, and, and we, sh we shifted course um, because we saw a much more deeper power at play um, where academia and art and uh, activism on the left are so often uh, married to critique qua critique. Um, there's this other thing at play. And in working with um, organizers and artists from the Lummi Nation and some other tribes in the Pacific Northwest, we became very inspired um, around training the gaze to where that power um, lives and to sort of expanding a visual language that can invite more people into it. Um, so this video is from an exhibition that we did when the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, which is the middle of coal and fracking country, in the museum, it's got a cafe called Fossil Fuels Cafe, um, and you and an exhibit where you can pretend you're coal mining in a shaft. Um, and the director at the time, who's was relatively new to the institution, said, "You know, it's really hard for me to talk about climate change when half my board and donors got wealthy off of extraction." Um, but you're right; I can host a totem pole that's a monument to resistance to. Um, to fossil fuels. And it's so much more than that, but that's um, the setup for this video, which was in an exhibition um, at the Carnegie and it played, that exhibition debuted at an international conference on the role of museums in the Anthropocene, which brought together 200 museum directors from around the world. And this was um, the exhibit that debuted then, so. The totem pole journey doesn't draw a new line as much as it traces over one that already exists, making it visible. This line runs through the rocks, through the trees, through the sky, through the oceans. The burial grounds of the ancestors weren't only on the land, their bodies were also pushed out to sea. This is why it's not just the land that is sacred, it is also the water. Lessons were taught centuries ago that have been passed down for generations. Lessons that guide us as stewards of the earth. The ancestors in this way speak through us to ensure the health of future generations. So it's also a line that runs from past to present and into the future. Today we face a great challenge. There's a prophecy that tells of a day when the rivers and skies turn black, the fish and the animals die. But it also speaks of a time when people will stand together to stop this from happening. What's happening in the world today is the result of a perspective that sees everything as a resource to be exploited. It's killing Mother Earth. It threatens life on the planet. People and animals are suffering. They're dying of cancers resulting from the air and the water being poisoned, but they're also fighting back. 
The totem pole journey is a project that makes visible the struggle for life. It brings awareness to the connectedness of the people to the earth and to history. It ties together communities who are living on the front line of the environmental emergency. It makes the commonality of their suffering visible and strengthens the bonds of solidarity between them. As the totem pole travels from place to place and comes into contact with more and more people, it grows more powerful. People who touch it give it power and it gives power to them. The journey also spreads the story of the prophecy and in doing so, it draws a line in the sand. The road that leads to death is not an option. The world is not made up of dead objects, resources to be burned. At this point in history, we are summoning all the forces of life that run through everything to come together in the common collective fight. From the ancestors to our grandchildren, Kwahoi, we draw the line. So this video is currently on display in the Quelhoy We Draw the Line exhibition that we developed with the House of Tears Carvers of the Lummi Nation. Um, uh, it'll be up all summer at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in DC, where you will also see a two scale uh, representation of the Red Road to DC poll. Um, so I'm just coming off uh, the heels of a, an eight month long project um, where on the 20th anniversary of the Lummi um, Nation's totem pole journeys, um, they carved the, the largest pole yet, a 25 foot, 5,000 pound totem pole um, that we transported to communities across the continent who are leading struggles to protect sacred places, lands, waters, and wildlife under threat at risk from dams, climate change, mining, and oil and gas projects. Um, so there was a virtual journey that lifted up uh, the Arctic and the Tongass and Badger Two Medicine and Thacker Pass, Nevada, and then a physical journey that went to um, the Snake River Dams and Bears Ears and Chaco Canyon and the Line 3 fight and White Earth Reservation in Minnesota, the Line 5 pipeline fight um, by the Straits of Mackinac in Michigan, and ultimately delivered that poll to Deb Holland, the first Native American to lead the Department of Interior, who spoke at a um, ceremony on the National Mall with a delegation of about 40 tribal leaders um, from across the country. And, um, and then the Smithsonian exhibition. So it was an incredible honor to, to work on this and to, um, to sort of elevate the totem pole as, as I said before, not reducible to a carved and painted 400 year old uh, Western red cedar, but uh, really it functions as a reciprocal, in a reciprocal way. Um, where those who put their prayers and, and power into it, um, that's what we drove to the symbolic heart of a wounded nation um, to deliver that to the federal government and to um, really call for the support of indigenous communities and tribal nations um, and the movements that are championing a way of like under, understanding the totem pole as a sort of monument right, as monuments to colonialism are toppling, this is a different kind of monument to a way of relating to the land based not on a logic of extraction and enclosure or ownership or control in which the individual is the denomination, right, um, but rather um, principles of reciprocity and intergenerational care of humans more than humans, the water and the land. You're muted, Prana. Thank you so much for sharing that. It was so powerful to see, you know, and to imagine all the hands <laughs> that have touched it and all, all of the fights, you know, uh, and struggles and, and sacred places that it's traveled to. Um, I guess since this was, you know, the last one and since it's just happened, I think I'm wondering um, how was, you know, how did people receive the totem? Could you speak a little bit about, um, you know, and your role as a natural history museum and how the collaboration developed and also kind of what was your 
your hope and your, you know your observations about the actual tour and how it weaved these different struggles and places together. Um, well, we worked closely with Native Organizers Alliance, um, which is a national uh, network uh, training and capacity building network in Indian country, as well as the House of Tears Carvers. And, um, and the events that took place at each of uh, these communities visited were just incredibly powerful. And, um, but so were those pit stops, um, you know, in, in the middle of, uh, you know, red states uh, often, um, where folks would come up and be like, what is this? And the carvers talking about it and it, like instantly sort of de-arming, disar disarming <laughs> folks. And a lot of people who, who laid their hands and prayed on it would burst into tears. Um, and it, it's, it, it really reveals the power of material culture, of history, of tradition, um, but, but when so much is represented within an object in material form and that we are invited to give meaning to it, to contribute. The Lummi don't carve totem poles, they carve story poles. And so you're invited to be a part of its story and make history. You're Thank muted. you for sharing that and apologies for um, the interruption of my child who's, who's telling me we don't have that many more minutes left in our conversation, <laughs> but it was such powerful um, work to see and I'm wondering, I don't see any more questions in the chats, but if you all have questions for each other about each other's projects, let me know. <laughs> Just one thing I'll invite people, if you want to go to redroadtodc.org, there um, are opportunities to get involved. And if you're in the DC area or passing through, the totem pole is on display in front of the Department of Interior at Rollins Park for the next month before it's permanently installed. I, I just wanted to say that I thought it was very moving that the work we began with, which was Nilda's museum, and then the work we ended with uh, Becca's um, Red Line project, uh, both um, are, in, you know, sort of incredibly capacious and invite, I mean, you know, the fact that they just open up to so many um, inputs and influences. Um, I think that that quality of invitation uh, is really so important in this, in this work, because uh, I think people are you know, frightened and uh, uh, isolated with their fears and questions. And it's, uh, uh, it, I think, a, a gift to feel that somebody is willing to invite you into the conversation. I certainly feel that way. I think people know more than they think they do. And if, and all you have to do is provide some sort of a platform and opportunity and things start blooming after that. Well, I think with that, um, I hope that this conversation and all the projects, um, both yours and the ones that inspired you have um, you know, allowed a lot of creativity and ideas to bloom in our audience as well. And I will, um, hope that this is just a springboard. Uh, we, I know that a lot of folks wanted the transcript and wanted to, you know, um, you know, links for all the projects that were mentioned or the other artists and activists and organizations that were mentioned. So we'll try and um, put that together uh, along with the recording and share that out with you when uh, in a couple of weeks, I believe, when we have time to edit it. Uh, and then I'll turn it back to Persephone to close us out. Thank you all. Um, I just want to echo Piranha's thanks, Nilda, Mary, Yuna, Becca, Piranha, for this um, really inspiring and powerful conversation. I think I know that I um, can really fall prey to the negativity that is surrounded with climate crisis. And in New York, we had a red sun um, just a couple of weeks ago, and it just it was very heavy. And I think you've brought in so many new ideas and questions and the creativity that art um, gives us you know, empowers us to deal with the with the difficulty um, of this situation that we will continue to live with. So 
Thank you for that. And thank you to everyone who's been on the call and joined us tonight. Um, we hope you'll join us again soon for upcoming programs organized in connection with this exhibition. Uh, we have a panel on indigenous representation um, in October and a symposium on new research um, concerning American weather vanes. So I'm gonna put links for those now in the chat and we will be sharing out um, with everyone the recording in just a couple of weeks with links as well to all of the incredible projects shared with us tonight. Um, and we hope that you all stay well and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you. Thank you.